Webb. I'll introduce you out to the stage. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So, our job is to talk about the future of media, um, but not the far future. We're supposed to be talking about media in the year 2020. And if you stop and think for a moment about what I just said, 2020, that sounds like some distant time off, right? But it's, it's really, you know, 20, less, less, than, less than three years away. Um, the things I think we need to keep in mind is that a lot of the technology that will be here in the year 2020 is still evolving and being developed today. Um, and so what I'd like to do uh, to start off this conversation um, is to pick up where that last panel left off. And they were talking, you know, we, we saw a lot of demos on virtual reality and augmented reality, which again feels very new, but these are two technologies that have been around now for two decades um, and, and that have been in some form of development. And everybody's talking about the future of computer vision. Uh, it was the big topic at F8 for Facebook, uh, Google, um, Apple, uh, you know, have SDKs out. Everybody's talking about it. So what I'd like to do is to start with John uh, from Betaworks. Um, so, so computer vision is a big, important topic at your shop. Um, you've got a new program that the deadline is October 10th. Can you talk a little bit about why the focus now on computer vision and where you see this trajectory headed? Sure. I mean, uh, I think that um, the you know, the way that we think about it, I think about it, is uh, you know what happens when your camera knows what it's looking at, and you can see that um, you know with the sort of platform developments in the last, even the last six months, uh, and the new devices that are in market now, new phones coming, uh, the uh, the Apple's ten phone. Uh, ARK at core, you can see that all of the tools and the platforms are starting to get there. And I think that um, uh, you know, uh, understanding computer vision, understanding how AR, understanding how sort of all the spatial components of that, and then how new companies emerge out of that is something that we believe there's going to be a lot of uh, new company development, new activity. And as you mentioned, we've got a accelerator program uh, which we're kicking off early next year, starts right after the first of the year, and we're taking applications for developers for that now. And that's called Vision Camp. Right. Now, you but, said something that I, to me that was interesting, which is this isn't just about headsets. Right. Right? So when we think about this broader ecosystem, it's about melding data and digital overlays and our physical locations together in some way um, so that we understand the world or see the world in a different way, right? Yeah. So I it's mean, not just about the headsets that we wear. It's not all the headsets. And it's also, I think that what we're seeing is we're seeing, I mean, we'll talk about this, I suspect, in, uh, in follow-up questions, but we're seeing the dividends of a massive amount of data that's been acquired, uh, spatial data, personal data, data that is now starting to uh, sort of rear its head as uh, you know, services and different capabilities. And I think that AR, uh, augmented reality, on one hand, seems very futuristic. You know, in my mind, uh, it went mainstream with Snapchat filters. And so, you know, face tracking, Snapchat filters, Pokemon, you could see the sort of the precursor, sort of the building blocks that start to get in place. And Pokemon's a great example because that was enabled by a whole bunch of geodata, which had been collected by Google um, over a long period of time or a fairly long period of time. Well, what about uh, all the people? So I know so, that I'm in it, like I know there's five people in the audience who are saying to themselves, "But Google Glass, right?" And who, who are thinking to themselves, "But I remember in 2009 when the Layer app launched. Right. I remember the Retour app. These things never took off. So what's different? What'll be different by the year 2020 um, that will suddenly make this ecosystem, you know, be commercially viable? We'll, we'll get a you know, critical mass of people using these tools. Right. I think it's actually way before. I, I think it's, it's, it's actually now because, I mean, you walk around the street, you walk around Fifth Avenue, and most of us as human beings are actually, as we're walking, we're staring <laughs> at these damn devices. And what, what AR is about, instead of looking at an archived image, you're actually looking at a transposition of the world through the device. Right? And so people uh, who are using Snapchat are doing that already today. 
um, and all the variants or copycats of Snapchat are doing the same thing. And I think this is just an extension of it. It's being able to look at the world and understand the world and see you know, the names of all the people in the audience right now, information about It's that metadata layer that we're beginning to expose. And so I think it's very real. It's gonna, there are pieces, big pieces that need to come. And I think glasses, headsets, embeds, all of those things are going to come. And we, but the, I think the wave which we're starting to see now is actually the app development and that, the dividends of the data uh, that is already in place. Yep. Yeah. I have two comments on this question. Um, one is we, we are, you know, you were mentioning Google Glass. I think the technology is actually improving. And we're going to see even better technology by the year 2020 with finer grain, grain resolution, bigger field of vision. Um, and it, that will just happen, both from the optics point of view, the computer vision algorithms, um, and, and so on. What people are wondering about now, and I have an answer to this as well, is what's the killer app? And I think my, for my talking with various um, faculty and, and st students around campus, and also having just come from Microsoft research, um, people are actually looking to the medical profession. And I was talking to the uh, dean of dentistry at Columbia, who was imagining using augmented reality, you know, a, a dentist with the headset on, but looking at the patient. Because right now, as, as he or she is doing the procedure, because right now, what do they do? They go like this. They're looking at the x-ray and looking at the. So the dentist does not want to do that. The dentist wants to look right at the patient and see the x-rays right there so he can or she can right. do the manipulation. And so it will be, you know, who knows what the killer app will be, but for sure I, I think the medical profession um, is, is looking at this kind of device as really enhancing their capabilities. I think that's a great example, not only in terms of the profession, but literally what you were doing was you were saying the professionals going data here Objective observation, patient here, data, patient, and now it's going to be just exactly. You know, so, sort of like, so it's layering that data on top of the world. Right. I think that the important thing to note again, because we are so, you know, as humans, we recognize patterns, and so the pattern that at this point we're used to is seeing a head-mounted display, um, or what we know of previous experiences that we've had with our mobile devices. But the future of all of this has a lot to do with the data that we shed the data that can be scraped. It has to do with deep convolutional neural networks and how that data gets processed, right? Um, which really means that the entire physical realm is in fact a digital, a potential for a digital overlay, right? Uh, I want to add to that point, and you are both making it before. It's not just the headset. A lot of the advances in computer vision are already um, being mined in, in certain startups that are now being bought by car companies because those sensors on those self-driving cars of the future will have this fantastic computer vision in them to detect whether a pedestrian is crossing the car, whether there's a stop sign in front. That's all object recognition. That's all computer vision technology. So it's not just going to be in your headset, if you will, but it's going to be in your car. That's right. And one of the things that we've and in my shop, I'm a quantitative futurist, so I use data, but one of the things that we've been modeling is that the phones go away, uh, not by the year 2020, but certainly within the next 10 years um, to be replaced by devices that we wear. So we've been talking about vision, but we should also talk about our other senses because our other senses intersect with the digital realm, right. and that would be voice and audio. Yeah, precisely. I mean, I, I triggered on what Jeanette said, what's the, what's the killer app? And I think if we take the, the word app out of that sentence and, and replace it with experience, uh, it opens up the possibilities you know, much wider. Um, so you're sitting on the sort of precipice of zero UI, which zero is to UI. say, you know. Make the, right. make the app disappear. Make, right. make the, uh, the, the interface disappear. Um, I think AR, VR are components of that. Uh, but certainly, um, there's a much broader set of, of things that will bring to bear things like personalization, putting data in context. You know, the, the surgery example is a, is a great one because it puts the data in the context of, of where it's useful. And um, things like AOR and layers can, can enhance the experience so you don't actually have to think about the interface. You just think about what you're, you're trying to achieve. 
Uh, and then in the context of media, which, which Audible would, would focus more in, um, it's actually taking you out of your current you know, environment and, and transporting you to somewhere else uh, it, almost within your head without you realizing. So, so it seems like, I mean, as much as we hear an emphasis on AR and VR voice, Mm -hmm. is, is the other huge piece of this. Betaworks, I know, has had a, an accelerator and a lot of different uh, projects uh, and startups that, that use voice. Amazon yesterday just announced a slew of new products. Yeah. Yeah, um, so. Audible is working on a whole bunch of new things. So talk to yeah. us a little bit about where you see voice headed over the next so couple of years. I, I think you know, it's, it's tricky to, to predict the future, but um, certainly voice, again, is, is another part of, of the set of tools or the set of capabilities that will make the interface disappear. Uh, Alexa has very quickly become sort of just the norm. Uh, I saw a meme yesterday or a, an item on Reddit where it's a two-year-old and she's holding a Game Boy and she just assumes it's a touch screen. And similarly, uh, you know, Alexa has, has almost, when I first saw that, the, the, the first echo, I thought, well, I'm going to have to go out of my way to use that. But no, it's already very, very quickly just become part of the the norm. Did you see the um, South Park uh, episode two weeks ago featuring Alexa? I did not. It was, uh, I would recommend that to everybody. It was pretty internal. I saw the Alexa, Alexa for old people it. on SNL. That yeah. Was, yeah. It was pretty great. Um, so, so all of these things, you know, putting the information in context, uh, speech, voice interaction, chatbots, conversational UI, um, I think they all come together to play an individual part in an overall experience. Um, so more than humans an talking app. to the machines in our lives. Versus sometimes talking, them. sometimes you know swiping, sometimes typing, uh, whatever the situation calls for. And, and, that, and that's yeah. I, I think it's um, this stuff is really hard. It's really hard because we have so many assumptions that we carry forward from the previous medium, the previous device. I mean, I'm sitting here listening to you, and I'm thinking, okay, I listen to Audible books. You have a data stream in your Audible book, or in the Amazon version, the text version of the book, which has highlights in it. That's right. Um, you know, how would I like signal that in an audio stream, right? Because yeah. that's imp that's interesting data. When I'm reading, I can see you know, 13 people highlighted that passage, but how to do that in a sort of like in a subtle way that's non-intrusive non to the experience mm -hmm. that the publisher actually is okay with. Yep. I mean, there's a lot of it's it's like think about that's this sort of zero interface, and it's, it's very tactical. This one. That's point. right. What's the? I'm just trying to go down to the 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 actual where the rubber meets the. Right, I mean, it raises all kinds of interesting questions. What's the equivalent of a vocal hyperlink? Right. Right? Yeah. Pretty soon. Um, what's the, you know, if you think about uh, how we cite sources now when we write, um, it would be incredibly intrusive to have verbal footnotes all over the place. Correct. Right? So what becomes the verbal equivalent of that? And just to segue, you know, into this other sort of elephant into the room, which is synthetic news, fake news. Um, once we're speaking to machines... Uh, how do you know what do what do we do about the problem that we have yep. finding credible information? That 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 also has to do with the uh, computer vision systems. Um, in order to train these systems, you have to you have to introduce false information. They're called adversarial images, but those can also be used to turn things upside down. So, uh, Jeanette, you want to talk yeah, us through? Yeah, this is actually you know a very timely topic. Not just because fake news is a timely topic but because the academic community is very proud of itself right now by coming up with lots of adversarial uh, examples of how to basically uh, fool uh, deep neural networks, which is the kind of the machine learning uh, uh, method of choice today. And just in the past, um, this summer, there's a special um, transactions on on graphics that has a whole bunch of these uh, adversary examples. And it's not just with images, um, so basically, they, you, can, you can feed these DNNs uh, images which, um, which will come out with a classification that have yeah, actually nothing to do with the original image. Right, just like something as it, simple it, as like one pixel off. Right, right one which pixel we off. Detect. Or it will classify you know, a panda bear as you know, some kind of uh, a monkey. And <laughs> with 90% confidence, and it's ridiculous. Um, but it's not just images, it's also audio. Yeah. So the other uh, examples that people are coming up with, and this is one of my favorites, is you, know, you can feed in audio streams. First of all, one example is you can feed in audio streams, and you can actually detect and um, animate uh, you know, some, some kind of 
person or, or character speaking that audio. So of course, uh, companies like Disney and so on are very interested in this, but you can also use it for bad. So for instance, one, in the one paper, they fed in a whole bunch of Barack Obama's speech, and they showed how you can have different ways of Barack Obama speaking that same speech. Now, you just cross the line one step further, and you know what I'm saying. You can you know, basically have, you can make anyone say anything. So that's... And, and at uh, CSAIL at MIT, yeah. there's a whole bunch of... Res they've been working there on um, predicting human behavior from a single still image. So yeah. if we're able to create video... Um, and sync that together with voice. I mean, we're right. that's, that's think, the farther future, though, the, right? That's not the the the, the, um, the fear or the the, the 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 tension we have right now is with fake news and all these ways that you can fool the DNNs, deep neural networks. Is then the mere mortal, you know, the public, the citizen, is is reading this information, um, looking at the pictures, looking at the video, hearing the audio, and like. What are you to believe? So, I, I, you know, on that note, I think I've been thinking about this for a while, and how do you solve that problem? I don't know that technology solves that problem. I think perhaps we, we focus more on a dis more discerning consumer with higher critical thinking skills, able, ability to put information in context. Um, because I, I do think there's a human element that's, that we sometimes miss. You're very yeah. optimistic. I want to. I, I could be I optimistic. I want to comment well, I, on I have that. Been told I, that. I, I agree. I also heard. I, I also heard Rob Kardashian this week is pregnant. So I mean, that's an example of fake news. But <laughs> I, 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 think. I want. I want to <laughs> agree with you, but I also <laughs> think that technologists have both a responsibility and a, and an ability to help the, the situation. Right now, I think everyone understands that DNNs are you know the machine learning method of choice, but we don't actually know why they work. As scientists, we're clueless, which is amazing. They, uh, the applications that DNNs have been put to in terms of image and speed recognition, machine translation, you name it, is astounding. But we don't know why they work. They work. They scale. They're practical. But as a scientist, we can't explain it. So that's another reason where you know, I think the, the science community has to step up to this and really try to help explain it and what's going on so that we can actually give an interpretation for those numbers that are spit out or I those classifications that are spit out. That's one thing. But also, as a technology person, I don't want to say we should, you know, um, expect the human person to be burdened with the entire responsibility. So the way I think about fake news is it's, it's a new kind of attack vector. Mm -hmm. And if you think about the source and all the different steps of the technology in between, including the communication, the pipe, the platform, the, app, the software, the hardware, all the way up, all of those pieces of technology that is touched by this attack vector, then there are places perhaps in that pipeline where we as technologists can intervene and try to help. John, but that's not the, to that. say yeah, that I, both ends are human beings. Yes, yeah. so I think it's a John, balance. you, you balance. use the word synthetic news rather than fake yeah. news. Can you just explain that a well, little bit? Well, I, I, um, I think about it as synthetic media because I think that it's very much keen off the uh, deep neural network work which is going on and the, the ability to create sort of the, the Barack Obama video audio stream that you mentioned, which is, you know, I, I think that... You know, the thread what I pull out of this is, is that, A, the, you know, since the election, I think that the mainstreaming of fake news as a, as a meme, as a concept, does raise sort of media literacy in a, mm -hmm. in a positive way. People are starting to think not everything that I see on the screen is, is true. Um, I think that it needs to go way, way further because I think that the pace of the technology development uh, is it, it's far outpacing our ability as human beings to understand what's actually happening. And then you thread on top of that is what's happening with deep neural networks. And is, you know, the way I think about it is they can't show you their homework, right? You, and so you, we can't discern what's actually happening there. And then I thread on top of that the fact that we have one platform specifically with Facebook um, because you can, this, this is an immensely complicated system, but we do have a single platform that is filtering you know, the majority of news for the majority of people in the world. So then I would like to end our, our very short session on that exact note with you.
On Facebook. On Facebook. So final question, uh, succinct answer. Facebook in the year 2027, what is it? So well, actually, I'll start with you, Francis, and then we'll move down the line. Uh, what is it? I, so 2027, um, just let me tune it. Uh, <laughs> I, I, hope, I hope Facebook disappears. I think it'll exist. But I, wh what I mean by that is... Uh, Maybe I should go with the first interpretation. But what I mean by that is it, it exists, but it's, it's more complementary to our lifestyle as opposed to in your face. Okay. And I really hope it's not regulated by then. Okay. John, 2027, I, I, what is Facebook? I think it will be, uh, I think Facebook, the big blue app, as we know it today, will be pretty much gone. I think it will be a technology hold, holding company, and I think it will be highly regulated. Okay. It will look like Marbell kind of thing. It's, uh, yeah. Jeanette? Wow. <laughs> Maybe by 2027 I'll have a Facebook account. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Um, I, I, you know, I, was, I was at the National <laughs> Science Foundation 10 years ago, and that's when Twitter had just taken off. And I remember having conversations like this, because at the NSF you're supposed to be you know, funding the research Basic for the research. future, right? And I would, I, I, technology advances are so rapid now that I would not dare to make predictions. I think those two that you said are, I would, I, I think those are very valid uh, predictions of where the future would be. I think the question of regulation is now a current debate, and it's a very important question. Um, because we we're talking about policymakers and, and regulators in the mix. And it's, we need a serious discussion about this, antitrust and so on. Well, my job is to see the future <laughs> and to model it out using data. And my answer to that is that Facebook is a regulated utility uh, and goes the way of the, of the baby bells. Wow. Um, so <laughs> this is the end of our panel. I'll be sticking around. I've got um, a handful of copies of my new book. If anybody wants one, I'll sign it and talk to you. I think you'll stick around for a little bit to answer any questions. Um, thank you to everybody. Thank you so much. And we're going to...